Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. What a great privilege it is to hear the story of how the Holy Spirit has guided and touched people's lives uh, using grace to open up our hearts and minds uh, to a truth that uh, we can only get close to using our reason, but by revelation, God awakens us to the reality of his existence, the reality of who we are in his eyes, and how he wants us to grow closer to him and to his church. And so that's what the journey home is all about, is hearing these stories and hearing, uh, it's not about us, you know, it's about what the Holy Spirit has done in our lives, mm -hmm. praise God. And so, again, what a privilege. Our guest tonight is Dana Kroll. Did I get yep. that right? Got, right? got that right? Former Church of God, Anderson, Indiana, and we'll hear about that. Um, and, and also I wanted to say that his full story will be in the uh, upcoming March Coming Home Network newsletter for those of you that uh, either are members or would like to connect with that so you can hear the whole story. But we're going to hear a glimmer of it today. Dana, welcome. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Mark. It's great to have you here. And uh, well, just before you start your story, uh, Anderson Church of God, did you ever think you'd be Catholic? <laughs> no, and it's it's interesting how the, the trajectory of uh, God calling us home to the Catholic Church started uh, with me being baptized as a baby in, in the Lutheran Church, uh, my childhood years in the Methodist congregation, my teenage years in a Baptist congregation to Church of God, which is very low church, a very congregational, uh, you know, the, the home church at Anderson, Indiana, is very, very really hesitates to say, thus saith the Church of God at yeah. Anderson, about things to then boomerang. Oh, uh, all the way up all the way all the way top it's been interesting uh, to see and I think it's precisely uh, looking back now um, the the Church of God Anderson's understanding of how there there's one true church the Church of God and that denominations are not what Jesus had envisioned yeah. was actually uh, was actually the correct spark. and I just found that um, the one true church was in a place that I didn't expect to find it so. all right well let me get out of the way let me invite you to start us from the beginning then well, and you know, it, it again. So Lutheran I mean, was where your beginning we began. Um, you know, mom and dad uh, were active in a Lutheran congregation, a group on the west side of Columbus, Ohio, and I was baptized there when I was, I think, six or seven weeks old. And for I, I don't remember the reasons why, but somewhere in my early years, uh, we moved down the street to a Methodist congregation. I don't think there was anything bad about the the congregation that we grew up in, but for whatever reason, when I was young, we we transitioned and. Uh, that Methodist congregation is really where uh, I, I just first remember uh, learning to love God, to love others. Uh, just a really wonderful uh, congregation full mm -hmm. of people who just love Jesus, love Scripture, and we had a wonderful pastor there. Um, and so up until the time I was about 10 or 12, uh, we were very active there. Mom and Dad were in a lot of Bible studies okay. and um, active in um, helping with the logistical and administrative needs of the church and just uh, contributing we had a homeless ministry there. You know, I played little league there. It just we were we were there all, all the right. time. Before yeah. the show, you and I just a brief time when we were yeah. talking about how when you were born, when I was born, and how culture has changed yeah. and technologies and such. Um, your parents took the family from a Lutheran church over to the Methodist mm -hmm. church. Now that in itself is a fairly new phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, were your parents longtime Lutherans? Um, or were they already of the now generations that are not that committed to a particular denomination? I, I would say we're, we're a family of, of Protestant mutts. I like to call okay. myself a mutt. I mean, um, mom had spent a, a lot of time in Lutheran uh, circles, but I think had also spent time. Her mother, I believe, was Presbyterian, if I'm remembering mm -hmm. correctly. My dad, my dad's <laughs> parents were, uh, one was, uh, they were Baptists, but my dad's dad had been like <coughs> Missouri Synod Lutheran. I mean, right. so there's just kind yeah. of that... Uh, what we've seen in the last, um, especially the last century, and yeah. the last half century, where you know we've kind of syncretized, or we, we can kind of move more fluidly, where in previous centuries it might have been unthinkable for a Lutheran to become, uh, yeah. say, a Wesleyan. Uh, that 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 just, uh, I, and I think that's how I transitioned into uh, my teenage years. What happened was, um, mom and dad stopped going to church for a while. Uh, apparently, they had given so much, and they kind of, I think they mm. kind of burned themselves out. There was a bad situation that took place one time um, where just our pastor had a very human moment and uh, just kind of I think it, it yeah. kind of went off on my mom in front of some folks and she just it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back and they stopped going to church but they allowed me and even encouraged me to go ahead and continue to go to church with um, my my cousins uh, at a Baptist congregation and so I spent 
my teenage years um, going to church with them off and on. Uh, but you know, kind of now I've, I've got a very evangelical and even fundamentalist sort of strand mm -hmm. to, to add to the, the Lutheran and the, the Wesley and Arminianism. And so, <laughs> I um, mean, it, you know, yeah. yeah, generally the, maybe the local Lutheran, local Methodist, local Baptist churches aren't as staunchly fine-tuned in their original theologies, but right. those are three radically different theologies that throw together in one pot. They are, but you know, it, it, and that's where I think when we ended up at the, the Church of God Anderson, Indiana, it was kind of a natural fit for us. My wife had grown up Methodist also. We were married in the, the Methodist Church uh, in Belfry, Ohio, where she grew up, a, another wonderful uh, congregation just filled with godly people who loved Jesus, and she had had great experiences there. But I think for us, in, and uh, especially with our experience in the military, um, where you know you meet people from all different backgrounds, and you just kind of get to the place where you're like, okay, let's agree on the common denominators, and um, we would, you know, when you boil it down, all Christians have in common that you know, Christ died to save sinners, and we try to, um, you know, in a chapel community on post, would try to, you know, use that as the the point of common reference to to have fellowship with folks. So it, it really didn't seem to bother us that much. You know, it's, it's, it's the first time I thought about that as you said that, that in a military situation, people have to learn yeah. to get along with the common denominators yeah. because you're at, you're, you're, you've got each other's back. Mm -hmm. And so there you are. Um, C.S. Lewis talks about what true friendship is, is not when you're focused on each other, but when you're focused on a common task. Mm, yeah. And there's friendship. Well, that's the military. It is. And we all, I mean, we, all, all the soldiers, uh, I mean, we wear the same thing even. And so um, I, I think, you know, St. Paul talks about how we, um, you know, we, we're clothed with, and as many yeah. of us have been baptized in Christ, we're, we've been clothed with Christ. So, yeah, I think that's kind of how it, it transitioned for us theologically and how God kind of used, I think, even our military experience to uh, kind of prepare us for um, being open to other ideas that we might not have been. I think um, the military basically. experience of World War One and World, World War Two is what has led to the openness of ecumenism. Yeah. Because Catholics and Protestants and Jews, we were all side by side. Absolutely. Fighting a common enemy. And all of a sudden we learn from one another, yeah. wow, we've got some things that are common. And, and yeah. the beauty of being in, in the service is, you know, you can meet, if, if you were raised in, uh, say a non-Catholic tradition that was very suspicious or maybe even hostile towards Catholics, then you get in a platoon with a guy and when you spend time with, with that guy or gal overseas in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan or another yep. you know, part of the world or even stateside just training, um, when you, you live in, you know, and, and sweat and labor together, yep. you learn uh, that, hey, maybe this person's you know, not as, maybe these beliefs aren't as, as, as wicked as I was told and so you can might, you might be op more open to it than you ever otherwise would have been. So you, you met your wife and you were married as Methodist? Well, we were, so, um, you know, my, my, I talked to you about my, my childhood and teenage years. Really during college, I kind of had a pretty standard, I, I mean, I, th I think it was kind of a quintessentially, uh, you know, American uh, Protestant, um, middle income, ordinary kid coming from the suburbs going off to college and partying and running around like a wild man. and, and and talking the talk, saying I'm a Christian, you know, getting drunk one night and going to, still tr going to church and still being plugged in with some ministries, but not really walking the walk. And uh, when I was commissioned, I was in R Army ROTC, and um, you know, the the beginning of my uh, senior year of ROTC, I submitted my dream sheet to the Pentagon, or you know, up through the channels to the Pentagon the week before 9/11 to say, hey, here are the there, here are the duty stations that I'd like to have. Here's what I'd like to do as an Army officer. Um, you get to request your, your assignment to be an engineer or an infantry officer or a signal yeah. officer, et cetera. And um, the very next week, um, I'm told the, the plane that hit the Pentagon actually struck part of cadet command. And so it, it not only launched, I remember being on the phone with my mom as we watched on that Tuesday morning what was taking place. I called her, she was at work, and mom, look at, oh, turn on the TV. And I just kept saying over and over, mm -hmm. this changes everything. I knew that I was gonna go to war. Wow. And so the following spring, um, after um, they, they had kind of reorganized and figured out, okay, we need to commission a lot more people in a wartime mm -hmm. army, I ended up being uh, becoming an infantry officer. And after my training in uh, 2002 and early 2003, I, um, Addie and I had met in college and had started dating when I was at Fort Benning, Georgia, doing my infantry training. And um, that was a time when I realized, okay, Iraq's looming on the horizon. I wanna be a husband and father. 
uh, more than anything. My dad had died when I was 19 of lung cancer, and we were extremely close, and I yearned for that, and I looked forward to being a husband and father, but I realized, I recognized, like, I'm saying I'm a Christian, but I'm not really acting like it. Yeah. So this great army chaplain came alongside of me and helped me kind of reset my path uh, towards God. And when I went overseas, we were engaged. And when I came home in 2004, we got married. Oh. And then, um, you know, Addie became an army wife. And we found that we had just kind of found our people. And we loved it. It was a great life. Yeah. Um, now, were you both stationed overseas? No, so Addie was, you know, she was just there with me. I was the only one who, yeah, we, you know, I was the only one actually in uniform, and, and I was not stationed overseas. I was at Fort Campbell, Kentucky in the 101st okay. Airborne Division, so it was within a, a day's drive of here in central Ohio, where mm -hmm. we're both from, and uh, it was a good fit. Uh, we were just starting out as newlyweds, and I was getting ready for my second deployment to Iraq in the summer of 2005, and went on a Monday morning run after a weekend, uh, which is a pretty standard thing and uh, collapsed and had a heat stroke because of some medication that I'd taken over the uh. weekend. And um, had what I was basically, a what I thought was my deathbed experience and, and um, came to, I was laying on ice, I didn't know where I was and I thought, um, okay, well I think I'm getting ready to check out of the net and I, and I prayed a prayer, something along the lines of, I started to lose consciousness again and I, I remember thinking like, this might be it. Huh. And I prayed something along the lines of, okay God, I'm. I'm scared, but I recognize right now that I'm not in control. And if I don't trust you now, then that means I never, I never trusted you. Uh, so if you're ready for me to go, I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and um, I felt like I had a choice. I remember thinking of my wife, and you know, I didn't see the, the tunnel of light and the booming angelic voice or anything. No, no, it, beatific vision or anything like that. But uh, when I opened my eyes, I had my wits about me again, and um, I, I started laughing, and I had gone from being sheer terror to laughing, and I knew that that was my second birthday. Mm -hmm. August 15, 2005 was the day that I discovered that I had a mustard seed of faith, that I could trust God on what I thought was my yeah. deathbed. I had 107.6 core temperature. I mean, I was, oh, yeah. thank oh. God they, they got me in as quickly as they did. So mm -hmm. that reset the, the path, the trajectory of our life, uh, we found. Um, Heartbroken as I was, and this may sound strange to some of your viewers, but I was left home as what's called a rear detachment commander, which is a really, there's a lot of stigma around that position in the military. Um, very few people sign up saying, in a wartime army, saying like, hey, I, you know, I'd really rather just hang out while all my friends go overseas and fight. Um, yeah. I, I was heartbroken when I was told that. But that fall, uh, as I stayed home and helped to take care of the families as we started to suffer casualties and started to minister to the wounded. It reminds, me, reminds me of yeah. what's his name and remember it's a wonderful life. Yeah. Remember he couldn't go over so he's at home doing all the it's, drives and everything. But it, It's horrible um, yeah. and it's actually harder in a lot of ways. I mean I remember one night I put, uh, put a, some of my guys replacement soldiers on a plane that, that took off from Campbell Army Airfield and bank left and flew literally right over our house at about 10 p.m. and I was sitting on the bed and I went <laughs> like this. And she's like, you're pitiful. I wish they'd deploy you. And I begged and pleaded. But um, God knew where he wanted me, and I learned to accept eventually. This is where God wants me because I was still an infantry officer, but for all intents and purposes, I was doing the work of a chaplain. Um, I was helping to facilitate funerals and helping to minister to people who were uh, in their families. who they were, they were battered physically and mentally and spiritually. And so I received my commander's approval to leave active duty to become a chaplain candidate. God called us to, not to the home seminary, um, we, we had been uh, simultaneously in a little Church of God Anderson congregation off, off base, great, like wonderful people, and we, we loved it there. They lavished um, attention on us as like the young newlywed couple, you know. <laughs> when I felt called to ministry, um, the interim pastor there asked me to preach a few times, and, and he came up to me, it was, and without me even telling him, he's like, you're feeling God call you to ministry, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. And so it just kind of aligned to, to become a chaplain candidate, which we did. And instead of going to the home seminary at Anderson, Indiana, um, with our denomination, I mean, Church of God would say they're not a denomination. Or, right. But, you know, at the home seminary, we didn't go there. We ended up feeling called to Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, oh, yeah. California, yeah. Cool. which was out of our um, our comfort zone, 2,500 miles away from home. Los yeah. Angeles is, my, my wife's from a town of 10,000 people. There's 10 million people in Los Angeles <laughs> County. There's 100 plus denominations there, really a great kaleidoscope, and people from all over the world, and even a handful of Catholics at, at Fuller, so across the denominational spectrum, great place to get trained for Army ministry. Um, and so that's where we, we spent three years there, and there were some dark nights of the soul there. Um, Fuller's 
approach to educating and preparing men and women for ministry is not to teach them what to think, uh, because it's, it, it, you know, it, it's not a denominational seminary. Right. But they seek to teach people how to think and how to ask the right questions. But I, I really, I saw people who clearly loved Jesus, who just were so alienated and felt so disoriented. I, I sensed it in myself. I, hmm. I felt like they took my Bible as I knew it, just as I was getting into my mid-20s and starting to think, like, hey, I'm starting to get a handle on this being an adult thing and figuring some things out. Um, it was like they took my Bible and put it in a blender and left the top off and turned it on puree, and this confetti goes flying all over the room, and, and the seminary hands me a roll of scotch tape and says, hey, have fun putting that back together. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the, it, that's almost the, the nature of the beast, because I went to a seminary like that. Mm -hmm. I went to Gordon-Conwell, which is the very similar, mm -hmm. but it's on the East Coast, right. Fuller's on the West Coast, and, and uh, they were two, in fact, one of my professors, one of my favorite professors, Gordon Conwell, became a professor at, at Fuller. You probably mm -hmm. knew him. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but the issue is when you have a school with evangelical students from 45, 50, 60 different denominations, yeah. there are lots of things you can't talk about. Absolutely. In a class. You can't talk about sacraments. You can't even talk about prayer. Uh, ecclesiology, it, the church, you can't. So you have this very thin... It was all hypothetical. It was all, well, what do you think? You know, I felt like there were times when I, was, I felt like I was yearning for my professor to just tell me what he or she thought, even if they weren't saying, this is what you have to believe, th that they would really hedge on everything and say, well, you know, my perspective is this, but here, here are the, or, or well, some people say this, they would kind of generalize it. And I, I just was looking for people to to kind of own where they were and not be not be ashamed of it, even if I disagreed with them, I would rather have someone say, "Hey, this is this is what I believe, and and this is why," and then we can talk about it. Our guest is Dana uh, Kroll. Were you active in the military then while you were there? At so Florida? I was I was in the National Guard as a chaplain candidate, so okay. I was not deployable at the time. I would circulate to armories throughout Central and Southern California, okay. one week in a month, two weeks in the summer, and kind of gain some ministry experience okay. there while I was part-time ministering as associate pastor at our little Church of God congregation, which was a great blessing, and I got a lot of preaching and mm -hmm. teaching experience, and it was, it was a, a difficult time, but a good time as new parents, um, and we were excited about getting back because this was the time of the Iraq surge, and I was on the sidelines for several years while my friends were going back yeah. to combat for a third time before I got back out to be with them. Um, finished seminary and was uh, the chaplain officer basic course and came back to active duty as a chaplain just in time for the spring surge of 2010 and went directly to Afghanistan uh, where I spent 11 months as a, a chaplain of a support battalion. So I wasn't out, um, you know, my, my brothers who were in the, uh, the rifle battalions were out on foot patrols with their guys and, you know, a friend of mine taking shrapnel with his men. I, I, I was not outside the wire as much as my friends, but I ministered in a, in a hospital that my unit had and um, to Americans and Afghans. Uh, who were obviously caught in the crossfire, and, and it felt like a validation of sorts, like, okay, man, seminary was hard, and it's hard to be away from my, my wife and my two-year-old son, and she's pregnant with our second son, but this seems to be validating everything that we, we went through in the call to ministry. And so um, came home from that deployment and was immediately on orders to go to a different assignment back at Fort Benning, Georgia, because I had previously gone through ranger training as an infantry officer, they had a need for ranger chaplains at the time, and they sent me to minister at the ranger school at Fort Benning, Georgia, which is a, a two to six month adventure, uh, an arduous challenge. Uh, for me, I took the f it took me four months to graduate the course. The rangers is a more intense. It's, it, they're, they're very elite infantrymen, and, and um, they, they do the, the basic things extremely well. And yeah. ranger school, you're doing the basics on a lot less sleep and a lot less food. Uh, and so I got to go back and minister to uh, a lot of great young men. Women are now able to go uh, attend and have graduated ranger school now. At the time, it was just men. Um, so I, I ministered to a lot of young men who were in the same place that I had been a decade before as a junior officer. Ranger school was the worst experience of my life um, wow. other than losing my father. And so but very formative at times. So again, a validation. Hmm. Uh, I'm going back and giving to these young men who are going through exactly what I went through and able to minister to them. and share the gospel. In Afghanistan, I'd average 10 or 11 at my worship services. Well, at Ranger School, because you know I'd give out some bread and peanut butter, um, I had 200, 200 Ranger students coming to my, you know, <laughs> things. And, and for that reason, this is where it gets interesting with the timing of, of the Catholic transition, because I remember even 
the Church of God would teach there are no sacraments, there are only ordinances. Baptism, communion, and foot washing, because those are the mm -hmm. three things that Jesus told us to do and that he modeled for us himself. Okay. But, but like good, there's an Anabaptist streak there, and it's, well, those things don't actually do anything. We just do them because Jesus told them to. So communion, for example, okay. is just a remembrance meal. Do this in remembrance of me, which Catholics would agree with. Catholics would just say it's it's also more than that. And I remember, interestingly enough, during this time, I didn't I rarely held communion in my worship services with those ranger mm -hmm. students because I knew there were men who were there because they knew there was going to be bread as part of you know the service. Right. I had experienced that as a ranger student. So it's funny now that I was hesitant to do that because around about the same time, there was one particular night that I actually had communion and I had used some unleavened bread and broken it up, and uh, I offered the leftovers after the service to someone, and he must have been a, must have been a Catholic, <laughs> or maybe a very, very high church non-Catholic, or a very Orthodox non-church, or a non-Catholic yeah. student. I said, hey, would you guys like to have the rest of this? You know, it's extra calories. And one of them went like, no way, sir, I'm not touching that. And I remember feeling oddly ashamed. This was even before um, mm -hmm. the Catholic transition happened. Um, so it was experiences like that that led to, um, I'm about three years into being a chaplain now, and while I was at the ranger school, I was selected to go over to a ranger battalion, which is a, it's not the school, it, these are ranger units that actually go overseas and, and mm -hmm. fight, and have been fighting continuously since October 2001. Wow. Um, I was selected to go to 3rd Ranger Battalion, which is also there at Fort Benning. Um, and a very, very prestigious assignment. I was extremely excited about it, honored and humbled to go there. And just as I had started there, I'm getting ready to go back to Afghanistan with my Rangers that fall. It seemed to be, again, a culmination of hmm. several, of seven or eight years worth of preparation um, to go and minister in this, in this very challenging assignment. Getting ready to get on the plane to go back to Afghanistan, and I get a call from my cousin Brian, who is David to my Jonathan. Um, he and I were inseparable childhood friends. He's more like my brother than my cousin. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the cousins, again, that I talked about going to Baptist church with them when I was a teenager. Yeah. So Brian and I, um, ever since we were kids, have just kind of really uh, just an implicit trust there. Brian tells me on the phone one night, Brian's a dyed-in-the-wool Baptist, loves Jesus, and is fiercely committed to Scripture more than anyone I know, a godly husband and father of 15 years and four kids. They have a, a fifth one on the way now. Um, and he drops this bombshell on me in the summer of 2013. Hey, uh... Katie and I are, we're going to become Catholic. And, you know, you can just kind of say it hesitating, and I know how awkward that is to say now because I've had to have that conversation many times myself uh, due to our transition. But I, I was incredulous. It was, I wasn't angry because, again, I served with Catholics. I ministered with Catholic priests. I know they're Christians. I wasn't like in this place where it's like, well, Rome is the whore of Babylon and, you know, the Pope is the Antichrist. I wasn't that kind of non-Catholic. But there's enough Romophobia, I think, yeah. woven into my, my upbringing to uh, make me shocked at a minimum. And Well, but Brian, but what about, what about this and this yeah. and this? And kind of went on that standard line. Yeah, if you had list. called and said, hey, Brian, I'm, I'm becoming Presbyterian, or I'm becoming Lutheran, or I'm becoming Methodist, or I'm becoming Assembly of God, or I'm becoming... Episcopalian, maybe. I was like, okay, uh, you know, right on. Yeah, yeah. I was Lutheran. Like I was Lutheran. I was Methodist and Baptist. Now I'm Church of God. Cool. And, and it's not whatever floats your boat to be that ca you know be that casual about it. But again, in the army, you just kind of get used to that. And yeah. in American culture in general, it's kind of like, hey, potato, potato. You do what's yeah. good for you. I'll do what's good for me. We don't bother each other, and it's all good. But it was different. And so I gave that standard laundry list of, of Protestant objections, which most of the viewers here uh, are going to have one or more of them, or maybe had one or more of them, which is, hey, man, what about the Pope? What's up with Mary? Uh, what's going on with celibacy of the priesthood? And why are there no Bibles? And, you know, if you go to Mass, why is there no Bibles? Why does the church keep the Bible away from the people? And all these kinds of um, stereotypical understandings of the church that I had always just kind of assumed— and again, had kind of written off to, well, we've got that least common denominator. I hate to speak about the Lord that way. But like yeah. the gospel, you don't want to speak about the gospel that way. But well, they believe that Christ died for them. Well, then they're Christians. Um, but Brian very patiently um, unpacked for me, but very directly, because he could speak to me as someone. On this one phone call? On, the, on many phone calls. Okay. Um, 
but on the first phone call in a series that followed, and then I was on a plane to Afghanistan, we didn't talk a lot that fall. But I started, I started thinking, you know what? Brian's got like a logically consistent, like an in, the internal logic of what he said was, I, I don't want to say airtight, but because I, I still would find some things that I couldn't quite get. But I was like, well, but that seems to make sense logically. It seemed like it was intellectually honest and and was historically accurate and faithful. Um, and it was scripturally based is what really kind of threw me off. When Brian sent me an email one night, he's like, well, hey, you know, when I was like, well, what about the Apocrypha, man? Like, why did the Catholic Church add those books, you know, later on? And he's like, well, actually, you know, Jesus quoted from those a lot. And here's a list of like dozens of references from the New Testament where Jesus is quoting, yeah. you know, from uh, Tobit or whichever ones, you know, yeah, I, I don't yeah. know those as, as, yeah. as well or as Or the I New do. Testament writers are quoting. The New, sorry, alluding. yes, thank you. The New Testament writers are, are quoting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'm like going, wait a second, that doesn't fit my paradigm. That doesn't kind of fit the lens that I've come to Scripture with. And what Brian made me realize was there were tons of a priori assumptions that I made mm. as a non-Catholic Christian, which aren't necessarily, which aren't necessarily, they're not like nefarious. They're, they're not uh, intended to be bad, but they can have real far-reaching implications if you're not aware of them. So if you come to your faith and accept, um, without questioning it, sola scriptura, the Bi uh, hey, we would say that, again, the Bible alone is our rule of faith and Christ alone is Lord as Church of God folks. Well, absolutely, as a Catholic, the Bible alone is my rule of faith, um, but how do I know that the Bible is true? Well, you know, as a non-Catholic, I would just say, well, you know, it's 2 Timothy 3.16, you know, like yeah. all scriptures God breathe and useful for reproving and teaching and doctrine, etc. cetera. Um, but it says all scripture, not only scripture. And Brian would very patiently point out to me, well, how do, how do you know that the Bible's true? I'd say, well, because the Holy Spirit gave it to us. And he's like, yeah, but the Holy Spirit gave it to us through people, like you just mentioned, yeah. and you know, I would think back to my church history classes and go, well, yeah, there were those councils, and if I'm accepting sola scriptura as true, if, or if I'm accepting the Bible as, as authoritative and true, well, then I'm also trusting that the Holy Spirit worked through a period of about 400 years after Christ ascended into heaven to validate which books were going to be there. And these were really, like, nagging things that started to kind of, like, go, and not red flags, but they would just start, you know, like, well, well, wait a second, but but no, 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 no. It, and I would go back and try to spiritualize everything. Hmm. Let's just spiritualize this because the church is just a spiritual body. You know, my relationship with Christ is just spiritual. This is where it got really dicey for me, Marcus, because then I started to realize that I had taken spirituality to the, the nth degree that I think a post-enlightenment, post-modern, uh, Western... Uh, egalitarian democracy type of Christian can take it very easily, mm -hmm. which is, well, we don't know what to do with physical passages like where um, baptism is described as saving you. Baptism now, which corresponds to this, now saves you, and we don't know what to do with that, so we spiritualize it, and we go, oh, well, he was just speaking figuratively there. Yeah. And I got stuck on, um, quite frankly, I got stuck on John 6, yeah. because there's no doubt about it that John 3.16 um, and related texts are the central Christian doctrine. It's, it's the gospel. Christ died to save sinners. He died for you. He died for me. But what I found is that I like to say the decisive Christian doctrine, or maybe the better word is the unique Christian doctrine, or the one that underpin, underpins and undergirds even the gospel itself, is the incarnation with a capital I. Right. And you can't get to John 3.16 without going through John 1.14. And those are kind of sine qua nons of being a Christian. If you don't believe that Jesus, that Jesus is God and man, if you don't believe that he was truly enfleshed, it's hard to say you're a Christian because that's what sets us apart from other Abrahamic faiths and from Buddhists and from many other yeah. world religions. That's the thing that scandalizes and offends people. So if I take John 1.14 to be literally, literally physically true, and that leads me to John 3.16, which validates that the resurrection was a physical event. And, and the, the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension are all physical events. Then how in the world do I get to John 6, where Jesus has this bread of life discourse, 
and says, I'm the bread of life and my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And the people who could have understand that, could have and maybe should have understood that the most physically, the people of you know, had followed God physically through the desert, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire and the, the tabernacle and then the temple and the showbread of the presence and how God shows up, right. how God showed up physically in the garden. There are all these times when God shows up physically. Why would he stop showing up physically now? If the whole point of our faith is that God became a man and that's the kind of the principal Christian doctrine and the gospel being the central one, then it follows that when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life and you have to eat me and drink me, and the people go, wait, time out. It's, they're like, okay, I, this, it, I, when I read this, I kind of try to put myself there like I would when I used to be a preacher and let's, let's try to take people inside that. But wait, Jesus, that's, this is like one of your parables, right? This is, this is a metaphor, right? And they, and they clarify and they're like, wait, you're saying we actually have to eat you and drink you. And he's like, he has every opportunity to say, no, what I'm saying is this, is, this is just a metaphor. This is analogy, this is analogous to this. What does he do? He absolutely doubles down on it and says, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Those are his words, not mine. And Marcus, I got stuck there. Yeah, well, let's pause there. Yeah, let's That's do, a good let's break. Pause That's there. a perfect play yeah. because, yeah, we have lots of time we could, talk, we could talk about the fact that you could say that, okay, you've got those came flesh, became reality, incarnation, resurrected, ascen ascension, very physical, real mm -hmm. things, not just mere metaphors, not mere symbols. And then we have this, so some of my today say, well, they misunderstood it back then, it's all symbols. And I'm saying, what, what place in 2,000 years did all of a sudden become a symbol? Right. Are we smarter than they were? The arrogance of our modern post-enlightenment, yeah. post-modern, we're so much smarter than they were back then. Uh, there's nobody smarter today than David in those wonderful Psalms, you know, they're, they're, uh, it's our ignorance. You know, we didn't think the people in the Middle Ages, they're a bunch of dummies back there. We got so much smarter yeah. today. So all this is in the background. We'll come back in a bit and continue our discussion. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host. Our guest is Dana Kroll, former Church of God, and as I mentioned earlier, his full story is in this month, the March edition of the Coming Home Network newsletter. If you want to find out more about that, stay on at the end of the program. You can get some connection information for the Coming Home Network. So you're recognizing or facing up to something which you had never uh, expressed as a chaplain. Mm -hmm is the reality of what Christ was saying, not merely just a symbol or a metaphor. Yeah. And, and I started, you know, going, um, I started attending mass. This is while I'm still a non-Catholic army chaplain. Um, but I started going because again, I was more curious and, and I, I had this creeping sense that, oh man, I might actually be Catholic. And we started reading more. We read Scott and Kimberly Hahn's you know, Rome right. Sweet Home. And I started bracing myself for what I thought would be Oh my gosh, I'm going to be completely ostracized if I do this. Everyone's going to reject me. And um, how am I going to provide for my family and all these questions? I thought maybe, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a more dramatic person by nature, and I know that about myself. So I'm thinking, this is just me. I'm chalking this up to a midlife crisis. I'm coming up with an excuse to um, di distract myself from kind of the bullet train that I was on in my, in my chaplain career. We were in a unit that um, on that fall of 2013 trip to Afghanistan, we suffered a bunch of casualties, and and I, it was a demanding assignment already. Came home, and Addie got pregnant with um, our third son, and so we're going through all of that. And I, while I'm wrestling with all this, and she's starting to wrestle with it too, because uh, I would explain stuff to her, and she'd go, oh, yeah, that actually makes sense. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, she... <laughs> She and I both realized, like, oh boy, this could have some real implications for us. And I think, I think the straw that broke the camel's back for me was um, we were at Fort Knox, Kentucky. I was with my Rangers on a couple weeks of training, and uh, I took my Catholic Rangers to Mass on um, Easter Sunday, and then the following Sunday is the one that I'm thinking of. Um, I was going to preach from the road to Emmaus that week, 
took my Catholic Rangers to Mass and attended with them. I didn't receive, but, um, but just, again, starting to feel like, oh gosh, this is the ancient church. Like, this is how early Christians worship. They went to commune at the table. And so at 11 a.m., I took them to Mass. And at, at 1 p.m., back at the barracks where we were temporarily, I, I held the service and I decided to do communion. I was stuck and I knew I was stuck, but I was like, daggone it, like, if I'm a, if I'm a minister and a chaplain, I, I need to be able to do communion. So I, 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 I shared communion with them at the end. And as they came forward, I, I instinctively said, the body and blood of our Lord. I always said that as a non-Catholic minister. Yeah. Reflexively said that. And again, I shared with you that story from Ranger School where like, I, like why didn't I want to share bread and, and juice mm-hmm. or wine with my Rangers? Like, why did that bother me? So I, I'm sharing it with them. And one of my soldiers came forward and made the sign of the cross and then received. And I realized I had just led a Catholic astray from the true table that this was, well, there's, it's not that there's no value in non-Catholic communion, but this, I don't believe that this is really the body and blood of the Lord. And if I did, I, I wouldn't be touching it yeah. because we haven't confessed our sins. Um, I'm not, I'm not able to do and that. And 1 Corinthians 11 is pretty strong on that too. Pretty strong about, you know, there are physical consequences for receiving it. It's not just a memorial meal. It absolutely is a remembrance meal, but it is the thing that it remembers is what a Catholic would say. And so, I, I was convicted by that. And same service during my during my uh, my sermon was more like a Catholic homily. I'm preaching from Luke 22 or 23, and talking about how the two men that were walking with Jesus, they knew the scriptures. They had been with Jesus before. I, I think if I remember the context correctly, they're walking with him. Their hearts are burning with him. They didn't recognize who he was until when when he invited. He insisted that they come in and recline at him with the table, with him at the table, and then. When he blessed and broke the bread, then their eyes were opened. That was, and I said this in my in my my sermon, you know, that's what Jesus invites us to come back to this table to meet him there. And I said, and you know, those two guys who had known all the scriptures, it says Jesus explained all the scriptures to them. I said, so I'm holding my Bible. I said, so apparently this isn't enough. <laughs> and I and I felt my face get real hot, and I was like, oh, and I clarified immediately. Don't get me wrong, this is essential. Like, this is inspired. We can't, like, God gave us this as a gift. But I realized, like, oh, I'm in big trouble. Went back home from Fort Knox, and next week at chapel with my family. We're singing in praise and worship. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. And presence was capitalized on the slide. And I couldn't resist. I leaned over to Addie and said, you know, if we were Catholics, we wouldn't have to ask Jesus to be here because he'd be physically here too. And when we left that day, I knew I wasn't home anymore. And so I began the process of letting my Church of God endorsers know and my chaplain superiors and my unit, my commanders know, hey, I'm sorry, this is really awkward to come to a very um, elite assignment and you get hired to go into that position because you know who you are and because you're settled. And I'm sorry to kind of like defrock myself here, but in my head and my heart, I'm a Catholic, and so if I need to resign my commission now, I will. Thankfully, the Church of God theology and my endorsers, who are like the liaisons to the Army, to say, hey, this guy can represent us, they had dealt with special operations units before, and they knew that me departing immediately on, a, on an immediate resignation would pull the rug out from under our family and from under the unit. Yeah. We were slated to go to Afghanistan yet again. And so in the midst of all this, Addie's having a really rough pregnancy um, a surgery in the middle of a pregnancy, oh. um, then preeclampsia. Um, mm-hmm. Our third son was born prematurely, so I didn't go to Afghanistan that summer. All this in the middle of, hey, we're getting ready to lead the life that we knew. Thankfully, we were given a year to transition. I felt morally awkward about it mm-hmm. because in my head and my heart, I'm a Catholic, but I'm still ministering here under the auspices of a Protestant endorsement, but mm-hmm. we did it. and. Our chaplains, you, fellow chaplains, when they disagreed with us, they, they said, well, we're glad that we're fo- you're following your heart and you feel like that's where God's calling you to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and we transitioned off active duty in the summer of 2015, bought our first house after hopscotching all over the country, <laughs> came home to Ohio and started to, okay, now we're gonna start to settle in. Well, I didn't have work and I decided to transition back to being an infantry officer uh, to help in the National Guard, just to kind of help unwind yeah. from the uniform because it's, 
I'm turning 37 this month, and I started doing the Army stuff when I was 18 and a half. So half my life is born by the military. And Addie loved being an Army wife. Our kids loved being Army kids. Hmm. Our last house on active duty, we were in a cul-de-sac, 10 houses and 28 children, Hmm. every single one of whom had something in common. Their dad is in the Army. Every Army wife has that in common. Now we move back to civilian culture where not only are we trying to learn how to be civilians, but we're also trying to learn how to be Catholics. And parish life is similar. No, had, you hadn't come in yet? Or we, had we had by this point. So, uh, sorry, we didn't come in until about 90 days after we left active duty. Gotcha. We wanted to give some time to transition. We did RCIA via Skype while I was still <laughs> on active duty um, and, and did it from Columbus, Georgia, where we lived, to Columbus, Ohio, where we live now. And so that when we moved home to Columbus, Ohio, we were received into the church shortly after that. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, Addie, Addie was on board, but even in the year and a half since then, it's been, it's been difficult. <laughs> we we kind of we knew that it would impact. Addie, Addie said one time recently, I, I knew that it would be hard, and I knew that there would be sacrifices. Again, Scott and Kimberly Hahn is kind right. of an example right. where we know it's going to be rough, but gosh, we didn't expect it to affect every part of our life. Mm. Um, we know, well, Jesus expects us to take up our cross and follow him, but we're like, well, we didn't know that the cross was going to be this heavy and this painful. Yeah. Um, we haven't experienced a lot of ostracism, but we've definitely experienced a lot of um, some pushback and maybe cold shoulders and you know, cold shoulders, like not necessarily, it, 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 but, but it, people are it, the, kind of confused or it's yeah. kind of like, I just don't get why you did that. Yeah. And even we're yeah. coming into being Catholics and Catholics don't you know, like they're not used to us yet. I mean, a lot of them are former non-Catholics, but just parish life is like is like congregational life as a Protestant. There's some overlap, but there's a lot of differences. Yeah. Purpose of going to mass is to participate in the sacrifice of the mass. And if I'm in, you know, if I'm in a state of grace, then I'm going to receive the Lord. It's not that we don't fellowship at mass, but the Eucharist is our fellowship at mass, <laughs> and that's. Uh, that's kind of foreign to someone who's used to coming in and being welcomed in. Hey, have some coffee. Hey, fill out this welcome sheet. And hey, go over here and meet these. Yeah. You know, that's kind of what we were accustomed to. And so it felt kind of cold. Yeah. They didn't mean for it to feel cold, but that's just kind of how it felt. But it really is a cultural change, uh, a family change. I mean, all these things are really different. And part of it is because uh, you don't understand yeah. A meaning of a lot of why the culture is this way, right. then it can be foreign. I've often said that uh, if a very faithful Catholic woman is praying with a mantilla before a statue praying the beads, yeah. a non-Catholic Christian has no clue. It's it, it it's just from the outside looking in, it's just straight up sacrilege and yeah. you know heresy and and all those things that you that you assume about yeah. it. And when you, I, I like in coming into the church as uh, the, the, the realization in that transitional year when I realized, oh gosh, I might be Catholic. I, I call it, like, it's like falling in love with the ugly, unpopular girl at school that everyone will make fun of you for, <laughs> for even just talking to her or for like, well, okay, you can talk to her, but really you want to like spend time with her. And once you get to know her, it's like, wow, she's, she's beautiful. <laughs> not just, not just on the inside, but even on the outside. And you know, the things that might be stumbling blocks for us and for a lot of people on that laundry list of objections. Well, what about the Crusades? What about, you know, the, the things that the, the popes did that were, you know, I, I, there's horrible things that popes did. Yeah, right. I, I, and it's, but once you come in and once you ask the church, what do you say about yourself? And you let the church speak for herself, then you can understand how those don't have to be stumbling blocks, how God can work through a broken group of sinners. I mean, Pope Francis said himself, I remember an interview right after he was uh, installed um, or elected. I'm still learning the right lingo, sorry. Uh, (laughs) That, you know, the the interviewer said, who is Jorge Bergoglio? And he said, I'm a sinner. And so how can God work through a sinful man to lead a worldwide church? But it goes back to that physicality that we talked about earlier. It's Jesus breathed on the apostles and gave them the authority to forgive sins. It says it right there in John 20, 23. I'm not yeah. making that up. That's what happened. So either I, I'm, it's all a big democracy and I'm just like Peter and I have the keys to the, the kingdom like he got in Matthew 16 and I have the authority to forgive sins or there might be a difference in authority yeah. that was conferred on them. And so these are all things that as we came in um, mm-hmm. became increasingly clear to us and 
and not objectionable at all. We often look back and to see that the start of the papacy, the start of the Bishop of Rome, go back to Peter. And so how do we understand the, the role yeah. of, of that Matthew 16 on this rock? But really Jesus points to another person as the, the beginning model mm -hmm. for what it means to be a pope, a cardinal, a bishop, a priest. That's John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. He must increase. I must decrease. That's the model. It is. Although it should always be for us too. That should always, and we fail that because we are, yep. as, as our Holy Father says, sinners. So we fail. Yep. Another image that we've often used on the Journey Home program as well as our work is that you could become a French, you could become a Frenchman over in a year. Mm -hmm. But how long would it be before another Frenchman mistakes you for a wow. Frenchman? Yeah. Maybe never. Becoming a Catholic is not merely coming into the church on a particular Sunday. Talk about that, that struggle yeah. of becoming. I think for me, the mass was absolutely crucial to the transition because as I, as I went, well, let's see, you know, you can find out a lot of, most of what people believe by what they do. And worship, you know, from seminary and what I had learned was like, why do we do what we do in worship and what are we communicating theologically and how are we expressing what we believe by what we say and sing and read and do? As I went to mass, I found, man, the mass is saturated with scripture. <laughs> and that the the focus on the table as the culmination, whereas whereas non Catholics, you know, the the worship generally speaking culminates with the word preached. Um, for Catholics, that's just the starting point. That's the end of the liturgy of the word, and the mass isn't valid without the reading of the gospel, as I've understood it. But that's just the transition into yeah. the word made flesh. And so for me, the mass uh, when we were confirmed, and this gives me goosebumps thinking about it, but. As we finally went forward after a year or more of going to Mass and dutifully flying forward and being right there, Jesus is right there in that ciborium, and the priests or the deacons holding Jesus, and we go forward like this and receive a priestly blessing, and I can't, I can't receive him. I've discerned that, that that bread is Jesus, and I need to eat him, and I want to eat him, but I can't yet because I need, I need <laughs> to make this profession of faith. And, and as we finally made it to our... our uh, our confirmation when our, our parish priest brought the chalice forward to us after we had received our Lord in, in the bread. We'd eaten the flesh of Jesus. He brought to us the chalice and he tilted it forward for me and it was like a burgundy and gold light that, that kind of went into darkness and there was the, the fragment of host floating inside. And I felt like I was inside <laughs> the tomb with Jesus. This was it's the mass that makes it all physical. This is where eternity and time meet. This is where divinity and matter, God and man meet. Yeah. This is, this is the, the, the center of everything. And in that chalice, in that place, I was with Jesus and I was, I was seeing the gospel physically and I was receiving it physically into me. So now I don't just believe the gospel and I don't just try to live the gospel with God's help but I eat and drink my faith. I can tell you I, 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 I eat the gospel now, which is a strange, strange thing. It's objectionable to, to Jews and Protestants and, and Muslims and people of all different faiths. It's strange even to a lot of Catholics. Yeah. But it was the mass to answer your question that was critical for us it, in understanding the Interesting parallel with some of the, the prophets that were given a message by God and then told to eat it. Yeah. Remember those old oh, images? Yeah. I haven't thought you know, of that. Written, no, eat no, the scroll. Eat the scroll. Yeah. Eat, the, eat the word. You know, mm -hmm. there's an interesting, interesting uh, parallels there. Um, uh, what other uh, a big barrier? You're coming from a, a very non-Catholic background. Yeah. Well, maybe another hard step for you to come in that you. I think for us it was just leaving what we knew. Uh, again, just the military was our life. And, and I'm still finishing up my time in the National Guard, and it still is our life. I would yeah. say the, the painful process actually came in the, the year and a half since confirmation where um, I, I assumed some responsibilities and even a command as a National Guard officer and being a, you know, an officer and a ranger and a commander. And as soon as I assumed uh, command of my unit, they received word of a deployment, which they're, they're training for and going on right now. Wow. And things got really bad a year ago in our marriage, I'm not gonna lie. Addie and I have a very strong marriage. We were coming up on 13 years of marriage. And there's an, we, we truly love each other. And we were at a place a year ago where we were having trouble speaking to each other. Mm. 
and I knew I was going to go away for another year. But now, wow. here's Addie without military wives around her. Our National Guard unit is spread all over, not just across Ohio, but across multiple states. She's not going to be connected to those ladies. And I started to realize with this creeping horror, mm -hmm. I could fall into the very spiritual adultery that I counseled all my soldiers against. Do not sacrifice your family on the altar of your career. Mm. And that's exactly what I was doing. And the most painful thing for me personally was last spring calling my commander and saying, sir, uh, I need to relinquish command. This is treason. And I can, I'm saying this on, you know, <laughs> a, 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 something that's going to go be viewed across the world. And who knows, some people who know me may see that. It's shame. It's shameful what I did from the Army's perspective. But if that bread is Jesus, as my cousin Brian said to me, and it haunted me throughout the, the transition, if that's Jesus on that table, I have to have that bread. And it is worth all of it because now I could have lost my wife, my relationship with my kids. For me, I think God had to take me to a place where I was completely broken. But, but it's also not just appreciate. it seems to me, not just appreciating the reality of the Eucharist, but the reality of the sacrament of marriage. Yes. You two are not just two people that agreed to be no. together. You are one. It's the very picture of the, the, the Eucharist it's, itself. It, it's, you know, again, the enfleshment, the mutual enfleshment um, that, that produces new life. And yeah. um, that love is made physical in our children. Um, there are all these things that marriage to me is so much more beautiful. It's more difficult in some ways now because now I truly have to give of myself, yeah. like Ephesians 5, I have to give of myself for my wife in a deeper and more Christ-like way. Um, but it's worth it because slowly, um, and I still have that. I mean, even last week, I was telling your staff before we started, you know, last week was rough and I was like, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't go on this, you know, I'm not qualified hey, to go your on this answer, show, you know? <laughs> Your answer as a Catholic husband and my answer as a Catholic husband is the same answer that Pope Francis gave when he became a Pope. We're sinners. Yeah. We're, we're less than God wants us to be yet and we desire to be more. We desire to surrender and to be better husbands and fathers. Help us, Lord Jesus. Thank God for the sacrament of reconciliation because every week I can go and I can be physically absolved. It's not that I couldn't be forgiven before by saying, gosh, God, I'm really sorry for what I did. Can the Holy Spirit forgive through that? God can do whatever he wants. I'm not trying to handcuff the Holy Spirit. But if I've got access to physical absolution from someone who's had a physical ordination with hands physically laid on all the way back to St. Peter, um, then why wouldn't I want it? Yeah, yeah. So Let's try and get one email in there. Sure. Doris from Oakland, California. The Eucharist is a difficulty in my study of the Catholic Church. Specifically, I just can't seem to understand why Catholics think that Jesus would command us to eat his body and drink his blood. How can I get over my repugnance to this idea? It seems so much simpler to simply see communion as a remembrance of Jesus' yeah. sacrifice and love for us. Why do Catholics get so stuck on this issue? I, and and, and it, you know, the church teaches that it's the source and summit of our faith. And until I, until I got stuck on John 6 and wouldn't, until I could either explain how to spiritualize John 6, as I alluded before, or, or accept what the Catholic teaching is, I, there, was no, there was no getting away from it for me. It's, it was repugnant to the Jews who heard it, and a lot of them left. And what happened, I would say to this sister in Christ, I would say, um, you know, Jesus said, well, what about you guys? What do you do with this teaching? Because they were like, this is a te difficult teaching. Who can accept it? And St. Peter, I believe, was the one who said, you alone have the words of life. Like, where else are we going to go? So if I can't take Jesus at his word when he says that, when it's, it is, it's, it's a strange teaching. It's, it is objectionable. It's, it seems blasphemous. It's, it's bizarre. But it is, if you start at John 1.14 and go through John 3.16, I think you can't get away from John 6. And that's how I got through yeah. it. So. Well, yeah. and again, 1 Corinthians 11 only makes sense if in the context of understanding John 6 that way, it seems to me. And the key, yeah. I think, also is when you go back to the early church fathers, this was already an issue right away. Early Christians were, were accused of being cannibals. I mean, that like everybody knew Christians are like the, yeah, it's, those are those weird people. They believe they eat their God. And, and I think we've gotten away from that in, in, in trying to, again, stick to the spiritualized gospel, which is true. It's not that it's not true. Christ died to save sinners. I, I can't be saved without Christ and the Holy <laughs> Spirit. But like, it's more than just spirituality. It is physical. 
because um, as uh, Pope, uh, John Paul II talks about, I think, in the beginning of Theology of the Body, we shouldn't be so scandalized by this because God was a physical God, if I'm remembering the right. first few pages of, of that tome correctly. It, it, it does scandalize us, but really, if we truly believe that it's true that God became a man, then to me, it's not that far of a leap to, to recognize that he wants to feed me physically too, not just spiritually, but physically. So it's about the fullness of the faith. Dana, what a pleasure to have it's you. It's been on a pleasure. Program. Good to have you here. Thanks for sharing your journey. And Thank you for our prayers are with you Thanks. as a husband and a father. Uh, God bless you, my friend. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I pray that Dana's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.